Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Christchurch Cathedral on this uh, beautiful, so far coolish summer day. My name is uh, Lynn Marchant, and I'm your celebrant and preacher for today. Uh, while people are still on vacation and doing what we're supposed to do in the summertime. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. I would have felt a bit odd if there was nobody out there talking to myself. Um, I don't know of any announcements. Or, uh, basically, everything you need is in your bulletin. Uh, we have Bruce back today and beautifully on the piano. He's back from his vacation in England. And uh, so we'll be blessed with his beautiful music at the piano. Um, everything you need, I say, is in here. Uh, the people at the back, if you need directions to washrooms or need help with anything, they will help you. And hopefully you can just relax and enjoy your worship today. I'm going to begin with the territorial um, acknowledgement. I just said to John, the hardest part for me is to say Hoden and Oshi properly, but we acknowledge that we gather today on the lands occupied by the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations at the time of the creation of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We honor and respect these nations and commit ourselves to walk together gently upon this land. strikes me off that that's before our worship starts. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A 
reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem and found, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me please where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. <coughs> but when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, a long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it? if we kill our brother and conceal his blood. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders <coughs> passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
This morning's second reading is taken from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, 
no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. (coughs) Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, yeah, I'm going to read the gospel first. (laughs) Somebody's going, gospel. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, I've done that once before in my life, too. And then at the end, I was like, okay, now I'll read the gospel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by the time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now I speak to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Please be seated. It's funny because I said to John, I said, oh, I was thinking about my sermon on the way here, and I thought, no, I don't think I like it anymore. I'm going to do the one that's in my head. Now I'm thinking, apparently there's nothing in my head. (laughs) Maybe I should just read the sermon that I had wrote. First, I want to say thank you to Sarah and Richard for being here to lead the singing for us today, too. I forgot to say that at the beginning. (coughs) I've got my morning croaky throat, excuse me. So, 
anyway, this is sort of the sermon that I wrote. Summertime and the living is easy, right? So in the gospel, and Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and the disciples have just shared in all of that chaos and learning and teaching. And then they're like, let's get out of Dodge, get in the boat, go to the other side and get some rest. And Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray. I read these scriptures a few weeks ago, like earlier in July, sort of to get them in my head and start to think you can have that luxury when you only preach now and again. Um, I could only ever have one set of scriptures in my head, so I could never, when I was preaching every week, I, I couldn't confuse myself by going too far ahead. So I had that luxury, and I couldn't help but draw lots of different parallels to the summertime and, and my, our summertime particularly. So um, here they've had this busy time, so I'm thinking, isn't summertime supposed to be like a quieter, slower time of living where you go to a baseball game or a soccer field and watch your kids or your grandkids playing and you sit on a patio or a porch and you sip wine or beer or whatever your beverage is and uh, kind of have more time to relax and it's about sandals and not shoes and not having to bundle up and all of that thing. But I think we still find ourselves kind of harried and running about, you know, there's a lovely outdoor concerts and we sit for a while and relax. But I think generally what Jesus teaches is that you have those busy, hectic times, but then you, you're aware of it, and he always would withdraw somehow and take time. So even if our summers are busy, how do we do that withdrawing and take time to pray and focus and gather ourselves again? So Rick and I have had the good fortune of having three visits already to my daughter's cottage, which is on Kawagama Lake, which is up near Dorset, kind of on the edge of Muskoka, near Halliburton. And that lake is 32 kilometers long. I don't know, it's kind of like an L shape, it's a long, but it's, it's huge, it's a big, big lake. And I've, I've been to the Sea of Galilee, I'm sure people here have been to Jerusalem and Israel and Sea of Galilee. It's about 22 kilometers long, but the Sea of Galilee sits in a bowl, it's about a thousand meters below sea level, and so these storms can whip up. So sitting on the dock sometimes at Quagama Lake, um, my daughter's cottage sits on an island, and um, it can be lovely and peaceful, and then up can come waves. And sometimes if you have to leave, you've just got to get in that boat, and it's like the waves are ridiculous. So I was thinking like, I don't know if I'd be jumping out of a boat. Like if somebody said, come, I'd be like, I don't think so. So that was one parallel that I was drawing, but then I go back to the story from Genesis, and um, it starts by saying, um, this is the family, the story of the family of Jacob. So um, this is the story of the family of the Lloyds. This is my daughter and her husband's family. And um, by comparison, I mean, Jacob's family had four wives, 13 children. He had 12 sons and a daughter and um, a busy household, no doubt, and I don't know how many sheep. So when we go to the cottage, my daughter and her husband have four children, and then there's just Rick and I. So you have, if we bring our dogs, four dogs and four kids and four adults. My other daughter comes and it becomes six, six adults, six dogs and six kids. Anyway, the times we've been there this time, we've just been four, four, four. So the oldest child is a daughter, and then there's three boys. So they're like 10, 12, 14, and the daughter's 15, almost 16. And so anyway, like all families, they get along really well all the time. There's never, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Rick has a nickname uh, from when he was a teenager and a family he used to go and visit and they were very rambunctious and whatever and he, he always called them the Bickersons. And so we'll be at the cottage and you know my daughter's kind of like, oh, she's a school teacher and teaches special ed so she's well used to you know difficult children but when it's your own it's different right you know and she's always like you know, boys and things like this, or sometimes it's like teenagers or girls, you know, <laughs> depending on who's whatever, you know, you, you just threw my underwear in the, in the water, get them out, like I didn't touch your underwear, you know, whatever, why were the underwear on the dock in the first place, anyway, things like this. 
and it becomes like, you know, a World War III. So, anyway, and Rick will just kind of laugh and say, it's the Bickersons, you know, another episode of the Bickersons. And um, another topic of conversation while we were there was that my daughter had said last summer, it's too long for the kids not to have like a week at camp or something, you know, to be at the cottage all summer. So they're, they're going to go back to camp. So they used to always go for a week of day camp at Cave Springs uh, before COVID. And then they bought this cottage in 2020. So it hasn't happened since. So my daughter decided, I think there's some wisdom in sending them for a week. It works for her anyway. <laughs> so the boys had all agreed this would be fun. So this one was a residential camp. So the two younger ones, the 10 and 12, they all have E names. So it tend to be like, so E3 and 4 were going to camp. I don't want to go. You signed me up and I didn't agree to this. Oh yes, you did. You asked me to sign you up. Those kinds of things. Anyway, so off they go to their camp. And uh, anyway, what was funny was that, so while they're at the cottage, you know, there's all this, they play, they bicker, they play, they bicker. And um, play a game, we bicker. He cheated, I didn't, you know. So then the two young ones get to camp. So they get dropped off on a Sunday at four. Monday happens. Tuesday morning, parents get a phone call. Um, number three had been to the office and said, um, Eddie and I have decided that we're homesick, so we'll be leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to call our parents and tell them to pick us up. It's only like a three and a half hour drive, four hours probably to, uh, near us. And uh, so they said, well, how about you spend the day and if you still feel like that later, we'll call the parents and you can have a conversation and we'll talk about it. So anyway, they call later on Tuesday, and of course the parents say, really, is that so? Well, how about you just, you know, enjoy the fun that's there, and, you know, you'll be fine. Wednesday, the phone call comes again, you know. This is ridiculous. I told you yesterday we decided to come home, come and get us. You think if you toy us out for another day, we'll just stay the week. And then Elliot, number three, says... Do you know how ridiculous it is? I'm existing on cereal and grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> and his dad said, just like home, apparently. <laughs> Doesn't matter what we serve you, that's what you end up eating. So anyway, they survived the week. And, um, but it turned out, in fact, that Eddie, the young one, was quite happy at camp. But Elliot was feeling homesick. So he'd gone to his brother and said, what do you say we call the folks and tell them to come and get us? And he said, okay, if you're not happy, we'll go home. And so even though, you know, when the truth came out, when they got back to the cottage, he, Eddie was like, actually, I was fine, but Elliot wasn't happy, so I was prepared to go home with him and, you know, side the story. So anyway, they had a successful week. Rick and I went and picked them up, and we drove up to the cottage. So the big discussion then was about yeah, but I'm not going back in August. You can cancel that other week. I'm still not going back. Now, the oldest son, who's 14, he also had asked, he said, yes, I want to go. So he's old enough to do a leadership training week. So he was signed up. Uh, there was a week at the cottage, and then he was going the last week of July. Anyway, finally, he went after all of this, you know, you forced me to do this, your terrible parents and all of that that we're used to. And, um, but radio silence all week. I don't know if he didn't have his phone or whatever, didn't say anything all week. Then he went to his granddad's for the weekend and he called his parents and said, I've heard nothing but amazing things about my two brothers. How kind they are, how helpful they were. I, it's like, what did you do with Eddie and Elliot? Like, you know? <laughs> Um, how they cared for each other and checked in with each other every day because Elliot was having a hard time and how intelligent and mature they had behaved. We we're like, those kids did not come home from camp. <laughs> but anyway, so that was the experience. And then Eli, who had also grumbled about going, he ended up, he had, was doing an, a, a volunteer week uh, his, uh, as a camp counselor. And so it was the next week. So he had a weekend with his granddad, and then he went back. Absolutely loved it. So thankful to his parents that they'd sent him. And, and now he signed up to go back for the same week as his brothers in August as a camp leader, counselor, volunteer, um, and to be in the same cabin with his youngest brother. And now they're all happy to go back. 
The point being this, because I had read this story, I said to my daughter, do you want me to tell you the story of the sons of Jacob? <laughs> because this is like from biblical times through till now, it has ever been thus, right? So what do we know about Jacob? Uh, if you asked his dad, he was his most beloved son, to whom he loved and adored that he made this beautiful robe with long sleeves, particularly, like you don't work very hard if you're wearing long sleeves, right? And this beautiful long robe. It also meant he was given the birthright, and he was son number 11, not number one. So there's subtle things going on, and he was also the firstborn child of Rachel, who was his favorite wife, if you remember. So Jacob got tricked, worked for seven years, got to marry Leah. When they took the thing off, he's like, oh, you're not Rachel. Then he worked another seven years before he got Rachel, right? So Rachel was always his most loved, and he had two other wives, concubines. So the boys that are out in the field looking after the sheep are the sons of the concubines, and that's who uh, Jacob says, go and check up and see what's happening and come back and tell me. So if you ask the brothers, tell us about Jacob, they're going to say, he's spoilt rotten, he's my dad's favorite, and he's a tittle-tattle. You know, he comes and checks up on us, then he goes back and he tells his story, and he thinks he's getting the birthright, he's going to get it all, like, we absolutely hate him. So it depends on who you ask, right? So then they see this opportunity, Jacob sends them out, go and check on them, you know, here I am, you know, I'll go. And they see him come in and go like, oh, that little snitch is on his way, you know, what's he gonna tell my dad this time? And let's get him, you know, sick of him. So Reuben, it tells us, steps up and kind of dilutes the plot a little bit by saying, what do we get out of killing him? Just, you know, might as well sell him. We've got rid of him anyway. They kill a goat, put blood on his robes, bring them back to the dad. Look, oh dear, woe is me. Something's happened to Joseph, you know, like probably met his end. Meanwhile, Joseph goes off to Egypt. Next week, you'll get the, the rest of the story um, about how they end up, the brothers have to go and eat a big serving of humble pie because they're starving and they have to go and ask for help. Anyway, in these stories, it's these crazy families and how mixed up they are, and yet God is in the midst of all of this, right? God is in the midst of it all. Then today we get Peter thrown in, um, literally thrown in, um, on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter, I just love him of all the disciples, right? Because he's like the kid in the classroom going like, pick me, pick me, pick me. You know, whatever you want to do, pick me, pick me. Peter's always so gregarious and enthusiastic and out there. And, you know, in this boat, there are a couple of gospel versions of it, and the disciples are terrified and not happy. But um, Jesus comes. He heard the account this morning, and... Um, they think it's a ghost, but if it's you, Jesus, call me to come. And then Peter has the courage to get out and walk across to Jesus. And like I said, when I've just seen waves on Coagama Lake, I'm like, there's no way. Like, that's courageous to get out and walk. But what happens, he starts to sink and falter when he starts to underestimate himself, right? And to me, that's the bit of the theme that's going on, whether it's the story of the Lloyd boys and how they underestimated even their own love for each other until they were kind of thrown in the deep end at uh, a camp, and then they know, you know what, I've got my brother, and I can go to my brother, and he'll comfort me and help me and be there for me. With Joseph here, I mean, it wasn't like that for Joseph. He was singled out. The other brothers were sticking together when they made their plot, but Reuben had the common sense to say, like, ah, killing him's a bit harsh. Let's just sell him off as to be a slave. But families are like that, right? And so, again, they had underestimated each other, and they underestimated Joseph because they thought he was just a dreamer, a spoilt kid, and um, the favorite, right? Somebody's always the favorite. 
I was the favorite. It's quite nice, actually, when you're the favorite. <laughs> I was the youngest of three, the baby of the family, and my other two sisters said, you're the favorite. In my daughter's family, they think it's son number, th number well, third child, Elliot's the favorite. I, they all say, he's the favorite, he's the favorite. So I think it's typical that we hear that, too. Does God have favorites, or does God underestimate any of us? Really? You know? So to me, the takeaway of this is, wherever you find yourself this summer, hopefully, you know, even if it's busy because you're fitting in a lot of fun things and, and nice things and enjoying the weather, if you have time to reflect and pray, whether it's sitting by a lake or on your porch or patio or wherever you are, taking that time to reflect, recalling maybe some of your own growing up and youth, but that in the midst of this, who we are as ordinary people, that we often not only underestimate each other and relationships, but we underestimate ourselves and what God calls us to do. And we underestimate just how important that is. So as we got out of the car today, Rick said to me, look at that gentleman over there with a the trolley and it looked like water and stuff. It was David bringing in stuff. And I said, yes, there's a cast of thousands at a church doing things like going out and buying stuff that's needed and carting it in. And then we come and we sit. And today there's a cast of thousands reading and singing and playing and so forth. And in, in God's own way, God calls us to do those things, right? Some seem small, like picking up juice and coffee, and some seem bigger, but it's within our means, and often we will underestimate ourselves. and God doesn't do that. God doesn't underestimate us. And so when we hear those small voices and sitting quietly through the summer, gives us time to do those reflections, to be like Jesus and go up the mountain to pray, to renew ourselves, to refresh ourselves, but also be, to be prepared and ready for when we hear uh, that hand reached out that says, come. And even if we feel, how did I get myself into this mess? And you start to sink in the water, to know that you will be lifted up. And if you say yes to something, it's by faith that you will find that you have the people around you and you have the skills you need because God will not underestimate us. Amen. As you're able, let us stand and confess our faith as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be comfortable for prayer. Sit, sit or kneel or stand. sitting, standing, or kneeling as you prefer. Please join with me in prayers for God's church, for the world, and for this cathedral community. Responding to the phrase, God of creation and God of love, the response, hear our prayer. We pray for all who lead, all who serve, and all who follow in your church throughout the world. We remember especially the people and clergy of the Iglesia Anglican de Chile, all those who worship in churches in the Diocese of Rupert's Land and in the West Central area 
of the Synod of Alberta and the Territories. We pray especially for the young people of Lutheran and Anglican churches who gather together for Clay 2023 ashes and embers. And we pray for the people and Bishop Susan of this diocese, especially the people and clergy of All Saints Ridgeway. God of creation and God of love, hear our prayer. God of all people, we pray for victims of war throughout the world, whether war with other countries, civil war, ethnic conflict, and terrorist insurgency. We remember in our prayers not only the victims, but all who attempt to prevent war and make peace and organizations such as Médecins Sans Frontières, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, and for all who treat the victims of violence. God of creation and love, hear our prayer. We pray especially for the people of Maui, for those who have been killed, those rendered homeless and impoverished, we acknowledge our own role and our own failures to act as this planet warms. Inspire us to make a real difference in our lives as individuals, as churches, as communities, and as countries to save this, your creation. On this day when we hear of Joseph being sold into slavery, we pray for the millions of victims of modern slavery, all who are exploited by others for personal or commercial gain, whether by trickery, coercion, or violence. The victims of human trafficking, forced labor and debt burden, domestic slavery, and forced marriage. We pray especially for the younger victims, victims of child trafficking, child soldiers, child workers, and child marriages. Give us the voice to speak out against these sins against humanity and the will to do what we can to aid and protect these victims. God of creation and God of love, hear our prayer. In our own community, we pray especially for Mary Ann and Philip Grant, for Monica and Matthew Green, Richard and Lorraine Gretzinger, Eric, Margaret and Richard Griffin, Dale Gunter and Brian Kreps, Helene Guter and Robert James, Sharon Hall, Michael Hannigan and Tom Comaroni. We also pray for all those who have asked for our prayers and who are named in the Chronicle. To that list we add any in our community who we know to live with illness or distress, loneliness, depression, anxiety, or any discomfiture of mind, soul, or spirit. Be with them, we pray, and share with them your comfort and your peace. God of creation and God of love. We pray for all who have departed this earthly life and whose absence we mourn. Pray especially for Myrt Myrtle Stickles, whose memory is celebrated by the flowers here at the steps. We pray also for Jeffrey Berry, for his family, and for all who mourn his loss. May you surround them with your comforting love and peace. God of creation and God of love. We offer these prayers on behalf, on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, 
go and be reconciled. As brothers and sisters in God's family, we come together to ask for God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're able, please stand. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. My sisters and brothers in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace be. Loving God, receive all we offer you this day and grant that in this Eucharist we may be enriched by the gifts of the Spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image, male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants, Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, we, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death by raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, generous God, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray together as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We be many of one body, for we all share one bread. 
My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome at this table. If you'd like to receive the bread and the wine, or one or the other, or if you'd like a blessing, simply cross your hands like this, and I'll know to give you a blessing. John, the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you, Louise. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Sandy, the blood of Christ shed for you.
Give me my communion. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, as we are strengthened in these holy mysteries, may our lives be a continual offering, holy and acceptable in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We do have a couple of announcements. John's going to come and make one about the super crawl. Meanwhile, I'm going to slip into something more comfortable, or slip out of something uncomfortable. On Friday evening, Eight uh, really remarkable volunteers were able to welcome 1,242 visitors into this cathedral as part of our crawl. That works out at 400 every hour. And amongst other things, uh, visitors were able to view the art of Murray Van Halen, a Dundas resident, who is here today sitting over on the side there if you want to ask him anything about the, the artwork. Next month, there is no art crawl. Instead, we have super crawl, which goes over three days. The uh, Friday evening over the 8th of September, Saturday afternoon and evening the 9th, and Sunday the 10th. And that will need significantly more than eight volunteers prepared to welcome people to the music, the history, the art, and the meaning of this extraordinary building, which as Dale Gunter has put it, has an unspoken mission to everyone who comes inside. You don't need to be a historian or an artist or a musician to say welcome, to say feel free to wander and ask questions. I can assure you that you already know a great deal more than anybody who comes into the building. At the back of the church, you'll find sign-up sheets for volunteers. Uh, they're divided into two hourly slots. You're welcome to do one or as many as you like. But please consider being one of our welcomers. You'll meet a lot of people who vary from the disinterested 
to the very interested and to the very odd and frequently the very, very surprised at what they find inside this building. If you have any questions, please speak to me or to Jenny or to Sandy over there. Uh, don't be afraid to volunteer. I can assure you you'll enjoy the experience. Thank you all. Thank you. Don't underestimate yourself. You can do it. <laughs> and Sharon's going to make a little announcement too. An important announcement. I received an email this week from Sue Crow Connolly. <laughs> You're and um, she had received what she thought was an email from Tim. Unfortunately, this has happened before. She contacted Tim and Tim had not sent an email. This is a scam. Uh, on, this has happened in, in our congregation before. I don't understand technology to explain it to you, but, um, and, and the, the last time it was very, very unfortunate because a couple of our parishioners were scammed out a considerable amount of money. So I'm, uh, Sue wanted me to let you all know, just be careful you, if you get an email that says it's from our dean, that is not correct, and just delete whatever you get. Unfortunately, there are people in the world who are trying every means possible to um, take advantage of others. We, we want you to be aware of that, and please do that. I have been scammed myself after my husband died, but I think this is important for everybody to be aware. I'm sorry that you have to be so uh, unwilling to trust people, but this is the reality we're in, so take care. Yeah, I got that email a few years ago from Peter Wall. It wasn't from Peter Wall asking to go and buy Amazon gift cards and scrape the numbers off the back and tell him what the code is. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think Peter would do that. But, you know, when you're kind and you're thinking that you're helping, then it's easy to, but trust your instincts and uh, be careful. Are there any other announcements that I'm missing? No? All right. Then I just have remaining the, the blessing to give you. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith and the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.